and welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. I'm Liz Brailsford, the new president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. I am greatly looking forward to meeting all of you in person when it's safe to do so. Our program tonight features two-time Pulitzer Prize winner and national security reporter for the Washington Post, Joby Warwick, whose original reporting describes how avoiding one catastrophe can unintentionally lead to another in his latest book, Red Line, The Unraveling of Syria and America's Race to Destroy the Most Dangerous Arsenal in the World. Please remember to purchase a copy of Joby's book and our audience receives a 10% discount from our partners at Interrobang Books in the online store with the code DFWWORLD. And remember that code is good for any of the books in your shopping cart, not just Redline. And if you're not local to Dallas, we encourage you to use the affiliate link included in the reminder email to purchase your copy from bookshop.org. We have a full schedule of virtual programs, so remember to check out our website at dfwworld.org for newly scheduled events. And next Tuesday on March 9th at 6 p.m. Central, we will welcome Karen Donfried, president of the German Marshall Fund, to discuss transatlantic relations as part of the 2021 International Perspectives Series sponsored by Haynes and Boone and presented in partnership with the American Jewish Committee. Speaking of partners, I know many of our viewers tonight are from councils across the country. And I'd like to thank all of our council partners listed on screen here for their support of our virtual program programming. Thank you so much friends and we appreciate your help. It's great to see your name there. Moderating tonight's discussion is our very own Jim Falk, now serving as President Emeritus of the World Affairs Council of Dallas, Fort Worth, after his recent retirement. Jim served our council well for 20 years, and I know we are in for a treat as he leads the discussion with our guest. Jim, I welcome you to your chair. Let me pull out your chair. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Liz. That's the way we do it in the virtual environment at my house. This is the council studio for a while. Hey, Joby, great to see you again. Thanks, everybody. Uh, you know, you may notice on the screen that we also have uh, Santa Fe Council on International Relations. As I slowly inch my way to the mountains, I'm happy to say that I've joined the board of the Santa Fe um, Council. And I know that many of our, my council friends have tuned in tonight. So thank you all very, very much. Joby, loved your book. And uh, I can just imagine the conversations that you and David Ignatius have. Uh, and uh, because both, you know, you, you've written three books of nonfiction um, and David has written both, but uh, you know, you just get a sense in reading your book that you're reading a wonderful spy thriller, like it's one of, what is it, Ben McIntyre or somebody like that, or John Le Carre. So uh, I had the chance to read Red Line with the power going on and off in our house in, in, in Dallas. Uh, I, for, I wish I'd had a Kindle at that point, but uh, it's a wonderful book and I do encourage people to, to pick up a copy. You will not regret it. Before we start, tell me a little bit, a bit about the interview that you had that got you your job at the Washington Post. How did you move from the number of papers that you had been, I, th I guess you were in Delaware, uh, you were with Philadelphia Inquirer. Tell us how you landed at the Post. Well, I have pigs to thank. Uh, and the, the story here is after the Inquirer actually went to, the, to UPI overseas for a couple of years and then down to North Carolina, where I was an investigative reporter for the Raleigh paper. And while there, uh, myself and a colleague stumbled onto an investigative story about industrial livestock operations, about huge hog farms. Not a very glamorous, sexy topic, but it was one that uh, was very important for the region. We found evidence of corruption politically and just all kinds of environmental abuses. So we wrote this series and um, Lo and behold, it won a Pulitzer Prize for, uh, for public service in 1996. And so that's the kind of thing that suddenly uh, allows you to, to get return calls from editors that wouldn't have spoken to you uh, previously. And I was offered a, a national job with the Washington Post, uh, being able to skip over some uh, 
some of the usual steps. So it was, uh, I, I hope my interview was, was okay, but I, I think it was uh, kind of the body of work and, and this, uh, you know, enterprise reporting that uh, landed me a spot actually as an environmental reporter to begin with. Um, um, and then went on from there to national security and other topics. Have you studied Arabic um, or how did you get your expertise in the Middle East? I have not. I, I was uh, once upon a time as a foreign correspondent in Eastern Europe. I, I, I learned German and I was beginning to try to learn um, Eastern European languages. But then um, this big shift in my career in covering the Middle East, I, I made a few attempts to learn enough Arabic to be polite, to make sure I'm, my, my, uh, my feet aren't pointed the wrong way. And there's all kinds of hidden rules that can get you in trouble uh, in, a, in, a, in a conversation with an Arab person. Uh, but I must say, it's a difficult language. It's difficult to read and write. And so I decided just I would save my money and, and use some really good uh, translators instead. So that's typically what I do when I travel. Well, one of the things that makes your all of your books so interesting is how you can really bring out the personalities of people. And so let's start our conversation about the book by telling us about perhaps one of the most important characters. Mm. Will do. And thank you again, Jim. I just have to thank you and Liz both. It's great to be back here, even if it's virtually, and I just hope you're all back in business and having your wonderful dinners again soon. Um, but to set the stage, I do want to share a very brief vignette from the book. It's from the prologue, and it's a story that sheds light on the early origins of the chemical weapons crisis in Syria. It's a story that helps explain why this one country, out of all the countries involved in the tumult of Arab Spring, was different, was more dangerous, was more unstable than all the rest. And it explains how Syria came to possess a weapon of mass destruction, and not just one or two, but an arsenal comprising the most lethal chemicals ever invented in amounts large enough to fill swimming pools scattered around the country and a country that was being torn apart by war and overrun by some vicious terrorist groups whom we know very well, including ISIS. So this is the situation the world faced in 2012 and 2013 when the White House was starting to put out warnings about red lines. But before that, years earlier, in the 1980s, there was a laboratory. And I'll show you a photo. Not just any lab, a military research facility whose purpose was to create a weapon of mass destruction for Syria's dictator. In this lab and in the book's prologue, we meet a most unusual scientist, a man who was educated in the United States, who fell in love with America, only to return home to become first a weapons scientist and then a top researcher in a secret program to make lethal nerve agents such as sarin. And then dramatically, he becomes a mole, an informer for the CIA. His name is Eamon. And I'm not going to show a picture of him. Uh, he, we don't provide his last name in the book because his family is, is living in other countries and we're seriously worried about reprisals. But he's a bit quirky. He's a man who decided to, to marry two different women at the same time, which is something you can do in Syria, but it's unusual for someone of professional class. And he talks about his odd family configuration to a visiting American in this snippet from the book. He seemed, to com seemed compelled to justify his living arrangement as another man might explain an extravagant impulse purchase. His first wife was an excellent cook, he said, but he decided to marry a second considerably younger woman, his secretary, out of a purely carnal attraction. Who could have foreseen such turmoil? The two women squabbled constantly, except for the times they, when they united to direct their scorn at him. He had wanted a spicier love life, and he ended up with a case of perpetual heartburn. I don't recommend this, he told his friend. But Eamon's uh, laboratory, at, um, creations were quite serious and quite good as weapons go. And so for years, he faithfully passed secret information about his inventions to the Americans. And one day he decided to give a CIA handler a sample of his wares, a vial containing deadly sarin that the CIA could then take home and analyze. The transfer takes place in the front seat of a car. Here's how it goes. After a brief exchange of pleasantries, the scientist produced a small package. It's nearly Christmas. You're a Christian, the chemist said, handing over the bundle. Here's a Christmas present. A few minutes later, the American was left alone to ponder what was inside the parcel's plain wrapping. Now, Eamon was ultimately betrayed thanks to a dramatic twist in the story that seals his fate. But years later, his inventions, the weapons he helped to create, cast a deep shadow over a war that it was already one of the most brutal and destabilizing conflicts of our time. But it starts, as my book does, with a lab in a very colorful spot. Thanks.
thanks for reading it. I think now people know why I enjoyed your book so much. Yeah. Just wonderfully written. You, know, you did in your research about 200, 250 interviews. And it's not the normal people that you see when you're reading a book about foreign policy or an episode like this. There are a lot of people who I suspect have, have never been interviewed by a reporter with the Washington Post and never even thought they would be asked. And these mm -hmm. are really heroes. And I wonder if you might pick one or two of them, uh, uh, maybe one, we're jumping a little bit ahead in the story, but, but maybe talk about Tim Blades because he's mm -hmm. such an interesting character. I love this character, and I, I, I hope that readers will love him too. But you're absolutely right. These are not the politicians. These are not the, the policy makers. You know, I did interview them as well, but I wanted to focus on, on these more ordinary people who made all the difference to this story. And you have this one, uh, he's, he's, a, he's let's call him an army chemical weapons specialist. His entire career has, has been dedicated to getting rid of chemical weapons. And I call him kind of the Ray Donovan of the chemical weapons world. Whenever a, a stockpile of something is found in Iraq or, or something is left over from a Cold War program in the United States, he's the one with his team that, that, that jets off to find the stuff to try to destroy it. And they come up with all kinds of interesting gadgets and, and ways of doing that. And so when the war is, is, is really raging out of control in Syria and the army is looking around for some solution, some possible way of dealing with all these chemical weapons, if they could get their hands on them, they turn to this man, Tim Blades. Tim Blades is cantankerous. He's colorful. He has uh, you know, a potty mouth. Uh, he doesn't uh, get along very well with his superior sometimes but he's absolutely committed to a job once he gets started on it. And so he tells the army that he can invent a machine that can be portable. He can put it in a couple of tractor trailer you know, beds and haul it anywhere in the world. And with mechanical energy and water and, and a few the treatment uh, chemicals to use afterward, he can turn sarin's ingredients into something that's relatively harmless that you could put in a tanker truck and send down to the to, uh, you know, Port Arthur or someplace to get, get uh, decontaminated. And the army was so impressed, they said, sure, you can make this machine for us. And he made one, then he made seven, and they all sat in a warehouse waiting for the day that maybe the, they'd get used or maybe not. What was the and name they, of the machine? They, they, we call it the margarita machine. It has a typically ar you know, army thing. It's got a, a, you know, a, a 10 you know, letter name that, uh, that's really hard to say, and, and it goes by an acronym most of the time. But when I heard it was called the Margarita Machine, I was I was in love with it because it clearly like, I remember that too. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's a great device. But it it looks like uh, you know it's a bunch of pipes and and colorful pumps and tubes and all running together. It looks like Tinker Toys in a way uh, on on some giant scale. But he made this thing, and and just out of pure you know pure force of personality, he becomes the guy that um, sort of leads the way for destroying these chemical weapons that uh, if you know United States could get their hands on them, which they eventually do. You know, there's so many organizations that, and unfortunately, you describe what they are and have their acronym, but there's a mishmash of organizations international and, and in the United States. I mean, I didn't know about DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, nor did I know about the OPCW. Mm -hmm. So I'd like you, and there are many others that you mentioned, but talk about those two. One is U.S. and, and one is international. DITRA is really interesting, and it is one of these kind of alphabet soup agencies that, that most people don't really know about. It, it's multi-service. So you've got people from the Air Force and, and the Army and various places, and their mission is to deal with WMD threats. It was set up years ago after 9-11, and it's got so many pieces that it's, it's just kind of a hodgepodge. And typically, the you know the, the military the commander that comes in to, to lead this thing might be a you know soon to be retired you know brass or someone who's on his way you know out the door. But at the time in 2013, when these events are happening, there's this this you know, real go-getter you know general who wants to do something with this group, and he ends up getting this incredible mission, which is figure out a way to destroy serious chemical weapons if we can get them. So he becomes this agency and this general become important players. The other is this thing called the OPCW, it stands for the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. It was created in the 90s after the second chemical weapons you know, ban went into effect. And its, it's a task is to make sure that, that no one ever uses chemical weapons in a war again. 
And since not many countries are into that kind of thing anymore, its main task was to send inspectors around the world to visit places to make sure that chemical plants weren't, uh, you know, straying from the from the regulations and and using their you know their chemicals inappropriately to make sure the Soviet Union, the, you know, former Soviet uh, stockpiles and the old American stockpiles were being destroyed, which is an ongoing process. But it's essentially a bunch of technicians. None of them had really ever taken on a responsibility where they have to parachute into a country at war to oversee the destruction of an entire stockpile. And is this it affiliated with the UN? Is it? They're, they're one of these agencies that has an affiliation with the UN. They're not directly under UN command. And that becomes a bit of a problem because when it's time to, to destroy serious chemical weapons, OPCW wants to do it. They want to run it. The UN says, well, that's way too big for you. We'd like to run it. And so you end up having this kind of clash of, of, of officials. And in the end, they create something that never, never existed before, this thing called the joint mission. A few people from this organization, a few from that, a lot of resources from countries like the United States around the world to put together a team of people who would do the very thing that they needed to do, which is to send people into a war zone and you know, a, you know, know, sometimes exposed to hostile fire, but to make sure that this vast arsenal is collected and taken to a port where it could be shipped out and destroyed. So does it have teeth? I mean, mm. that's one of the issues that you run into with World Health Organization. Yeah. It really doesn't, it can't really make anybody accountable. And, and this is kind of a consistent theme, and, and, and you well identify it, that OPCW, you know, has technical expertise. It, it knows what it's looking at. It can tell you, okay, well, this is sarin, and we know where that came from. But it, it doesn't have, you know, you, just like all these other organizations, they operate by consensus mostly. So if you want to get something done, if you want to punish a leader for violations, you need the Russians to be aboard. And so that's been the challenge since 2012, 2013, is, is getting some kind of consensus to take action against what were really clearly war crimes. But we can't prosecute them as war crimes because Syria has very big allies, very important allies, including one with a, with a veto at the Security Council of the UN. Carlos, we're going to get to your question in a minute, and let me ask all of you viewers, do send in your questions, and we'll get to just as many of them as we can. So let's get to the title of the book, Red Line. You know, one thing that surprised me was, and, and I'd forgotten this, it's not as if President Obama stood up and made a, a statement, a pre-planned statement about this, he sort right. of fell into it at the tail end of a press conference. Ben Rhodes probably was <laughs> pretty upset about that at the time. You could you could just feel the the wincing in the room when he when he used those terms. But that term, but you, you're absolutely right. This was not something that was scripted. The use of the word red line. I think if Obama could do it over again, he would have said it differently. But just to offer the context, this was a moment. This is 2012, the middle of the, of the year, and it, this this statement, this warning, is a reaction to some very sensitive intelligence that the United States is getting at the time. And this is intelligence that really hasn't come to light, and and I describe it in the book in some detail which is that the Israelis in particular were convinced that Assad, the president of Syria, was about to give his chemical weapons away to Hezbollah. This, as everyone may remember, this is the militant group. It's set up next door in, in Lebanon. They're great friends with the Iranians and the Syrians. They have 10,000 or more art artillery rockets pointed at Israel. So you can imagine the, the, the horror when it, it looks like there might be a transfer of weapons. And so the, the U.S. administration, you know, really has a hair on fire moment. And they, they send uh, Obama himself out four different times to, to make a warning. Don't do this. Don't share the weapons. They send Hillary Clinton out to say the same thing. And they send out, you know, emissaries, Bill Burns and others to go meet with the Russians and the Iranians and say, don't do this. And one of those instances was, like you said, it was a tail end of a news conference. I think it was Chuck Todd at, at, who just asked a question about this problem. And Obama kind of repeating himself said, you know, this, they can't do it, they shouldn't do it, it would be a red line for us. And those words carry a lot of weight. It means something to people. It certainly meant something to Syrians. They thought it meant that if there's a violation, there's gonna be a military response from the United States, which of course is what they were all hoping for. Well, we know that was a defining moment, both for President Obama, as well as changed, in a sense, Russia's involvement. Yeah. Uh, was, if, if the British Parliament had been in favor of it, do you think that would have had an influence on the US Senate um, and, and Congress, uh, and, and that we would have had some form of um, armed attack? Yeah, I, I'm absolutely sure. I mean, I 
you, one can never be sure, but to the extent we can be certain about these things, it seems very likely that the, Obama would not have waited for the Senate. He was really primed to strike. He was personally upset about what he had seen. This this was a, the attack that took place in 2013 was, was killed 1,400 people, according to US estimates, most of them women and children, civilians who were essentially you know, asleep in their beds when these chemical shells landed in their neighborhood. And so, yeah, there was, there was a plan on the table to strike. Um, Obama wanted to be careful. This was you know, a claim about WMD in the Middle East, and we all remember how bad that went the last time. So we wanted to make sure that the intelligence was right. There was also a problem of an inspecting, inspection team, this UN um, group of UN weapons experts were in Syria at the time to investigate earlier chemical weapons attacks. So we wanted to pull them out. It doesn't look good to, to, to send, you know, to have a military strike when you're still uh, investigating the crime. So that was weighing on him. And, and then when the British decided there's going to be a coalition of three, Brit Britain, France, and, and the United States striking Syria together, the British took a vote and decided, no, we don't want to do this. So then Obama starts to think, well, this is, this is not looking, you know, this is looking problematic. The Germans are saying, don't do it. Other countries are, are urging caution. And so Obama decides to, to, you know, go the safety route, which is to go to Congress and say, look, I want to do this, but I want to have Congress behind me. And, and the White House was really convinced that Congress was going to support him. So they go out, they canvass their friends, the Democrats, they ask the Republicans. Nobody wanted it. The Republicans didn't want any part of it. The Democrats didn't want to get involved in another war. And so Obama is left there really with no options because Congress has said no. His allies have backed out. He really has no way forward until so this magical deal suddenly appears on the horizon. What were the targets, do you know? So, it, you know, it's, it's interesting because the target list, as I've been able to reconstruct it, was pretty similar to the one that Trump used years later, 2017, when he reacted to a violation of the red line by, by ordering a military strike. It wasn't a decapitation. There was no effort to, or no attempt to, uh, to have a regime change, to destroy command and control facilities. It was punitive. So it was going to hit you know, some military bases, mostly just one, uh, disable runways, destroy a few planes, essentially tell Assad that we're taking this very seriously, we're, we're going to hurt you. Uh, the other thing they cannot do is strike the, the chemical weapons themselves, because if you hit a bunker where chemical weapons are stored, the greater danger is you're going to release those chemical weapons. Go there's going to be a poison cloud that's going to drift into neighborhoods, and you're going to end up killing more people than, uh, than perhaps were killed to begin with. So all these are weighing you know, on you know, the pros and cons of the military strike. It, you know, it was the one thing that Syrians expected, though, which was something that was going to completely change the course of the war. That was never on the menu. That was just not on the plan. And from what I've read in your book and other reporting, Russia maybe really miscalculated or didn't really know what the United States was going to do. And that, that affected them, didn't it? Yeah. So the Russians took the red line threat very seriously. And they weren't sure what the US were going to do, was going to do or what the results were going to be. But they, they surely wanted to prevent it. They wanted to protect their guy. Assad, um, as our viewers may know, was is, is a very important ally to Russia. Uh, Assyria is, is the home to the only uh, warm, water, warm water port for the Russians in the entire world. They have a, a big Navy base at the port of Tartus. And, and so there was you know, they wanted to stop this strike. And also, to be honest, they were a bit frustrated and annoyed with Assad at this point. This uh, chemical weapon spectacle, this attack that killed 1,400 people, had gone way out of control, and everybody in the world was upset about it. And so it also seemed to them that getting rid of those chemical weapons would do everybody a lot of good and might knock Assad down a few, few notches. And so they ended up being behind this initial idea to try to eliminate the stockpile. Talk about the relationship. Uh, well, let, let's go at it a different way. Did Samantha Power and the then Russian ambassador to the UN, Sergei, um, what's his last name? So would it be Lavrov or Chukin? Um, Chukin, the yeah. UN ambassador, or was it really John Kerry and um, his counterpart, Lavrov? So in this case, it was Lavrov and, and Kerry, and there was a really interesting little dance that takes place um, in, in terms of making this deal work. In one instance, you have Obama and Putin meeting privately at a, at a summit in, in Geneva, just on the sidelines, there's no aides present. And they kind of whisper to each other, you know what, it'd be great if we could get rid of these weapons. Putin, you know, can you help us do that? Uh, three days later, Kerry is giving a news conference in London, and, and a reporter asks a question, what would it take 
to to make you not strike Syria with your with your missiles. And Kerry says, well, the only way that could happen would be if Assad agrees to completely disarm and get rid of all of his chemical weapons and allow inspectors in. But that's never going to happen. So it's just a hypothetical. So Kerry's flying home the next day. And on the plane, Lavrov, the, the foreign minister of Russia, calls in and says, hey, we heard your press conference. Sounds like an interesting idea. I think we could get Assad to go along with it. And three days later, they're back in Geneva to hammer out this accord, which for the first time calls for the elimination of an entire WMD program. But it has to take place in very little time, nine months. And it's got to take place during a war, which has never happened before in history. So let me bring in a, a question from Ray Termini. And Ray, you know better than this. This is a long question. My goodness. <laughs> if we were virtually, I'd go, Ray, you're going to have to make it shorter, but let me try. With respect to the Syrian use of chemical weapons, it has been said that in 2016, Obama worked out a military partnership with Russia and Syria. It appears not to have worked well and that the Russians are now, are now active in Syria. Uh, in 2018, Trump, with British and French allies, the U.S. did limited strikes against Syria. And my friend, Mr. Termini, goes on. But he gets the last part of it is, should Biden, what would Biden do if Syrians <laughs> resume the use of chemical weapons? So there's a lot for you to unpack there. Yeah, there's, there's lots of good, good points to raise. Just to take a couple of these. Um, so, so as all this is happening, as weapons are being moved out of, of Syria, the United States is trying to do something else. It's trying to train and equip rebels. It decided in 2013 it was going to do this. It spends a billion dollars training tens of thousands of Syrians to fight the side. So they're, they're, they're actually quite busy at the time. And in 2014, 2015, early in 2015, it starts to have an impact. They start to actually push uh, Assad's forces out of some, of some of these areas like Idlib, which is a city they still control in the north. Russia starts to become very alarmed, and Russia's response is that, well, we're not going to let our, our guy fall, and so we're going to commit actual troops. We're going to send planes, Russian planes. We're going to send you know, our, our military, not just advisors, but troops. Um, Iran was doing the same, and so you end up seeing all this reinforcement that takes place in 2015 with, with real military might being brought to bear against the rebels and on the behalf of Assad. And so this changes the reality of the war. You know, the Syrian, the Syrian rebels are never able to regain momentum after this. And so there's sort of by late 2016, with a few exceptions and with the lingering conflict going on with, with ISIS in the east, Assad has won the day. Russia essentially guarantees his survival. And so from that point on, it becomes, yeah, there are a sort of accommodation for each other, the US and, uh, military and the Russians deconflict on the use of air power because they're sharing airspace. Um, but Russia, from this point on, essentially is in the driver's seat, and that, that continues after the Trump administration takes in. Uh, President Trump was, was pretty much content to let uh, Russia take over the problem. Diplomatically, we disengaged. Uh, Russia, uh, Trump wanted to pull all our troops out of Syria. He tried to do it twice and then changed his mind. So it, it gets very complicated, very murky, but from about 2016 on, uh, clearly Russia is kind of calling the shots, and, and we're very much in the backseat. And I'm happy to say that Ray Termini said, wrote me and said, thank you. So that's good. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, take a follow up. Right. One of the terrifying parts of your book, though, is the potential relationship and ties between uh, ISIS and how close they got to getting perhaps some of the Syrian chemical weapons. How close did they get? There are two groups are worried about. One was ISIS, and they come kind of late. They come in 2013, and they start to, to do some pretty scary things quickly, including overrunning military bases. The other is a group called, we used to call al-Nusra. It's changed its name several times, but it's essentially an offshoot of al-Qaeda. So you've got al-Qaeda on one end of the country, gaining ground, holding territory. You've got ISIS moving in from the east, and they've come very close a number of times to knocking off bases where some of these chemicals were kept. And that's why it becomes Pretty alarming, uh, especially in the middle of 2013, when there's there is we're starting to see these these terrorist groups, essentially real terrorist groups, gaining ground. Uh, they uh, Al Nusra besieges a military complex near Aleppo, where chem where chemical weapons were made. Another group comes within a few hundred yards of taking a, 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 an air base in the eastern desert that was, you know, thousands and thousands of gallons of, of, of sarin precursor were stored there. And so these are the close calls. And um, 
you can if this this is why it became so important for the americans and almost an obsessive interest in getting the chemical weapons out because it seemed like only a matter of time no matter how the conflict went there's going to be a moment where these groups are going to be able to seize a convoy take over a, a something even if they didn't know the chemical weapons were there necessarily then they would be like hey what do we have now we're going to use this in some way it only takes a few leaders you take you know a, you know a small tanker of, of sarin out of the country into turkey or someplace that like that you've got the raw ingredients of, of some pretty serious uh, terrorist attacks around the world potentially so that was the sort of the alarming feature and as the book goes on we see that isis kind of gives up on stealing stuff and they think, well, you can get a lot of attention with chemical weapons. We'll just make our own. So they, in, in Iraq, it, they have university facilities. They've got laboratories. They start to put together a chemical weapons program that can make mustard gas, and it works. Yeah, and, and let me find the name of the fellow, of course, you'll remember. And I thought he was such a tragic character. He was Iraqi, who was a geologist, mm -hmm. low-level bureaucrat, lost his job, and got recruited by ISIS. Talk right. about him. So his name was Al-Fari, um, right. he is uh, Suleiman Al-Fari, and as you said, he was you know, a, a bureaucrat under the Iraqi government before ISIS took over Mosul. ISIS comes sweeping in, everybody loses their jobs and their paychecks, but he eventually starts going back to his office hoping that maybe ISIS will give him a job because, you know, you need to work. And ISIS comes in and, and looks at his qualifications. He's a geologist, but he's also sort of a metallurgist. He has you know, chemical or scientific specialties, and they, they recruit him to, to help out with this chemical weapons project they have. They have some scientists who had worked under Saddam Hussein who know how to do this stuff. They've got facilities, and they put him in charge of essentially rounding up the equipment and supplies. And so he does it. He says, he told, I actually interviewed the guy. He was in prison in, in Erbil in, in northern Iraq when I met him, and he was quite candid about it. He said, well, it was, it was a job. Um, it had a paycheck with it. And, and he also intimated to me that he didn't really mind. He thought that uh, that these ISIS guys weren't so bad, really, if you can kind of ignore some of the, you know, the crucifixions and the beheadings and things like that. They actually kept the streets clean and they, they cleaned up his neighborhood and they got rid of some of these annoying Shiites that used to bother him and, 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 and try to shake him down. So he was a willing and happy helper for ISIS. And he witnessed the program go from this essentially an idea into just something that really had some potential. ISIS was getting closer and closer to be able to make something that they could use in a terrorist attack. And if it wasn't for the intervention of, of the US, we, we targeted the, these operations very heavily and mostly covertly, they really might have come up with something that, that could have been used in terrorist attacks around the world. How confident are you now that they're still not trying and that they don't mm -hmm. have the infrastructure to do so? Not at all, because we know the names of some of the scientists uh, the United States is, has listed some of them and, and, and imposed sanctions, put them on terrorist watch list. There are a number of them that are foreign nationals. There's a French citizen. There are several others who went to ICE, went to Syria or to Iraq to help with this program, and they're gone now. Everybody assumes they're still alive. There's no record they've been killed. And as far as we know, they're off someplace trying to figure out how to do this. They had you know, assets in Syria and Iraq because they own territory. They could, they could operate labs and things like that in the open. It's harder for them now, but they have the know-how. They're not going to forget how to do this. The institutional memory is there. And they also know that there are ways that you can cheat. You don't have to make sarin. You can, you can get essentially, you know, common chemicals that you can buy in any industrial supply facility and combine them in the right way. And you've got some very toxic materials that can kill people in a subway or a sports arena. That we know the idea is important to them. Even back in Osama bin Laden's time, he used to talk about weapons of mass destruction being a religious duty, something they felt obliged to do. It's hard to make a nuclear bomb. It's not very easy to make a biological weapon that you can contain and control. Chemicals, they're different, and they're very scary, and they're very powerful. Well, this is a good time to bring Carlos into the conversation. And Carlos asks, were North Korea, Cuba, or Russia ever involved in serious chemical weapons? And I'll add to that. Are any of those countries potentially involved with ISIS? Hmm. So on you know, what uh, the help that uh, the Syrians got, I was expecting in the beginning that I was going to find all kinds of, of fingerprints to other countries, that perhaps some Russian scientists came and helped out or, or others. They did get some help. And in fact, after the fall of the, of the Soviet Union, there were some freelance weapon scientists who were looking for work, and some were, were, uh, were Armenian, and they came and helped out and gave some advice. 
Uh, there was a lot of equipment, not from bad guys, but from our friends, from the British and the French, the Germans were willing to sell supplies that ended up being used in, in these chemical weapons factories. If you walk into one of them, you, you would see a big tank that still had the, the labels from the German company that, that manufactured it. So in that sense, there was a lot of help that was inadvertent. But they also had some real expertise they had cultivated on their own. And we know this because the CIA was inside the program with their spy and they watched it develop. There were you know, scientists who had studied in the West. They understood the chemistry. They understood sort of the mechanics of how to make things. And they tried and they tried and experimented with various things until they could make it on their own. And so that was pretty much a homegrown um, uh, specialty and, and weapon system. Um, in terms of you know, the, what worries me really more about ongoing research uh, we do have to worry about what countries like Syria may try to do in the future. But we also know very well now that countries such as Russia and North Korea are very interested in chemical weapons, including some very advanced stuff. We've seen now the Russians carrying out, carrying out two assassination attempts using a very lethal nerve agent outside their soil, you know, once in 2017 in England, and then the other against well, this in Russia, but against an opposition figure. The North Koreans did the same, where Kim Jong-un tried to kill a stepbrother at an airport with, with, uh, with one of these weapons. So they have them, they continue to, um, to study it and work on the technology, and there's, there's uh, no reason to believe this is not an ongoing active program. So getting back just to Syria, I mean, we know that a lot of the sarin was destroyed eliminated. But since then, Syria has continued, the Syrian regime, Assad, has continued to use chemical weapons in a variety of ways, causing hundreds, if not thousands, of deaths using chlorine and other chemicals. So why isn't there a red line against mm. chemicals like that? And, and can we really say that we were successful in eliminating the weapons back in 2013? Yeah, there's no question that we did not get them all. Um, and even folks like Kerry, who were quite defensive about their accomplishments, will say only when they're speaking candidly that we, we eliminated the declared stockpile. So we got rid of everything the Syrians told us about. The CIA's assessment now is that the Syrians admitted to probably 90 to 95% of what they had. There's another fraction that was kept back, hidden someplace perhaps, maybe some of it was destroyed, which they claim, but it was not taken away by us. The other thing that the Syrians have is stuff like chlorine. Chlorine is an industrial chemical. You use it in your swimming pool. You use it in drinking water. It's not illegal to have it. They've got a lot of it. And so when they got rid of most of their sarin, for a long time, they didn't use that anymore. But they would simply take you know, chlorine from, from their industrial supply house, put it in a barrel, and drop it on, on, on an apartment complex. You don't kill a lot of people with chlorine. It's, it's much less lethal. But if you get a high dose of it, if you inhale a lot of it, you can be killed. Mostly they use it to terrorize, to, 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 to drive rebels out of their strongholds or, or uh, you know, to depopulate neighborhoods. And so it was a very convenient poor man substitute for a real chemical weapon. And from the United States point of view, you know, they'd just gotten rid of this declared stockpile. And then you see these little attacks popping up using kind of, you know, a cheat. It wasn't a real chemical weapon as most people thought of it. Technically it is because any chemical used as, as a weapon is a chemical weapon, but it was hard to, 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 to muster the sort of the political, you know, diplomatic will to make a big deal out of somebody taking chlorine from, you know, from a drinking water supply company and using it as a bomb. And so there was a lot of vacillation about it. We tried to work with the Russians to put pressure on, on the Syrians to, to stop doing it, but it wasn't the kind of you know, clear violation of a red line that would necessarily warrant a military strike. And also a lot of it happened while we were still on the ground trying to take out the sarin. So it got, got very complicated and, and very controversial within the administration. Um, Ralph Levy has a question. Are pro-Western Arab regimes, uh, Jordan, Egypt, he cites, involved in Western anti-terrorist efforts? They've been good allies, particularly Jordanians, and I, I know their system quite well because I've spent a, a fair amount of time in that country. In Egypt, the, the Sisi's uh, counterterrorism folks have been cooperative with us and the Israelis as well, much more than I think people will talk about publicly. But those two have a pretty close relationship because they're both very concerned about an ISIS insurgency in the Sinai, so between you know Egypt proper and and these in Israeli territory. So they work together cooperatively on that. 
the Jordanians, I must say, they're they are one of our, our key allies in the terrorism fight around the world. Um, the 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 king from the king on down to the intelligence services, they see terrorism. They see folks like ISIS and and Al Nusra as existential threats to them. Uh, again and again, these groups have tried to you know to come in and, and attack Jordanians, and they've done so successfully in a few cases. But because they have the networks, because they have you know the you know the Arab speakers. Um, they have the personal relationships, the CIA and other agencies rely very heavily on them to be our eyes and, and ears in the region and sometimes beyond the region as well. So I, I think people get the, the you know, impression sometimes that the CIA is, is all powerful and we, we can do everything and, uh, and you know, we have people everywhere who, who know everything. And the reality is our technology is very good. Our eavesdropping ability is, is quite good. But for human intelligence, for the difficult stuff of knowing what you know where terrorist threats are bubbling up we rely on our partners and we're fortunate that we have some very good ones and we do spend a lot of money to help them to support their budgets and operations but they're vital to keeping america safe well i think anyone who reads your books uh, they will not question the expenditures mm, uh, that is true. <laughs> so we have about another 18 minutes keep your questions coming and we'll work them in the conversation we have not talked enough about the cape ray uh, you know, we talk about Operation Warp Speed. If there was ever a, a warp speed operation, it was this. And uh, mm -hmm. I have to say, I think I'm glad they weren't off the Gulf Coast. But take a few minutes and 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 tell our viewers about this, um, the risk that they took and how it worked. Yeah. So we remember our friend Tim Blades that we spoke about earlier, the guy that vented the margarita machine, and 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 we made seven of them and we put them in a warehouse, thinking that probably will never use them. So when this deal is made, when the Syrians decide in September of 2013 that they're going to give up their chemical weapons, then it's like, whoops, well, how, what are we going to do with them? You know, if we get them out of the country, who's going to take them? And, you know, option A was, well, we're going to find some country that will be nice and take this on. Nobody, the Russians, the French, the, you know, everybody we approached said, no, thanks. We don't want those toxic weapons coming to our country. So the only option that was left by November of 2013 was to take those machines, those margarine machines, and put them on a boat and take it out to sea, take the weapons out there with you and destroy them in the middle of the ocean. That is such a bad idea for so many reasons, one of which being that ships at sea are constantly moving. You know, things get jostled around, pipes bend and break, um, you know, all kinds of things can happen. But that was what they were left with. And so Tim Blades takes his machines, they put them on this boat called the Cape Ray, which is part of the ready reserve fleet. It's, it's a row row, which means you can, you see a big drawbridge kind of a thing at the stern there. And, uh, you know, vehicles can drive in and out of this, this ship. So they kind of cleared an entire deck, put the machines down there, sealed it up. So that in case there was a spill, it wouldn't be hazardous. And, and Tim Blades and his men went to work for 42 days, taking one barrel after another, feeding them into their machine, collecting the waste products and then getting rid of them, you know, at the end of the voyage. The complication was, well, A, and here's Tim, our, our, our friend, uh, well, one complication was that there were a lot of countries that were upset about this. And the idea of having chemical waste, you know, you know rolling around the, the Mediterranean, the, the Greeks and the Italians and, you know, all these other countries were pretty upset about it. And so some environmental groups organized flotillas, protest ships, to go out and try to find the Cape Ray and stop it. And so the Cape Ray had to be escorted by destroyers, by military vessels, to make sure that nobody interfered with his work. The other problem that was a bit alarming was, you know, a cargo ship, typically cargo doesn't move around. Cape Ray is different. You've got all the fuel at the bottom, which is ballast that keeps this, this ship, the ship stable. And all these chemicals, you know, all the waste products, millions of gallons of them are going up to, to storage tanks that are mostly on the upper decks. So as the ship continues on its mission, it's getting more and more top heavy. And that's bad for a cargo ship. You can reach a point where it becomes unstable, you know, a bad wave, you know, any number of things could cause it to, to tip over. And that becomes the real scary feature, you know, as the, as the voyage is, is ending because they're running computer programs every day that, that calculate the stability of the ship. And they're seeing it getting closer and closer to the edge with, with only a few more days to go to finish the job, but the fuel is getting burned off. They've got no way to refuel. And it's, it's a really a hair raising moment for folks on the ship. How close to, were they to not getting the job done or having to well, uh, change what they were doing? Yeah, and so they, for a couple of reasons, they, they, they really 
had close calls. One was that their initial design of how they were going to destroy the, the chemicals on the ship turned out to have a, a major flaw. There was some an unanticipated chemical reaction that was taking place that was jamming up their equipment. And so they had to basically tear it down and start all over again or rewire the system in the middle of the voyage. If they hadn't been able to overcome that problem, they would have been sunk. There was just no way they could have finished. But I mean, it really is American ingenuity at its best, isn't it? It is. And I have to say this about Tim because he, he actually will uh, he'll, he'll brag about it himself. Tim never finished college and it's part of his lore. You know, he's you know, he's, he works as a chemist, but he essentially doesn't have a chemistry degree. He is someone who learned all the stuff he, he knows through labor, through through trial and error, through experience, and surrounds himself with some very smart guys. None of them have a PhD that I, I saw. Most of them are, are essentially, you know, you know, MAs or or, or, bas or bachelors of science. Um, but they're really good at their job. They don't take no for an answer. They don't wait around for, you know, or make excuses or wait for permission. Sometimes they they just get the job done. And and that's kind of the beauty that we still have people like that in our system that were not cowed by you know, all, the, all the obstacles. And they said, we can do this. We know we can do it. And if things start to fall apart, we'll figure out a way to get around it. And it's really a story of American ingenuity that defeated this problem. So uh, Chris Hellman asks, why couldn't serious weapons be destroyed at the chemical weapons incineration facility the US built on Johnson Atoll? Yeah, and that's an excellent question. There are, People have forgotten that we had a massive chemical weapons program in the Cold War. We had tons and tons and tons of sarin and VX and all kinds of other stuff that we had to then get rid of, you know, starting in the 80s. And to do that, we built an entire chemical weapons destruction complex, including this island facility out in the Pacific, where you would think we you could just roll up a you know, ship and just get rid of the stuff. It turns out that you know sometimes our own regulations tie us up. It's 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 a Syrian product. It's not legal for us to accept materials from, from Syria. It's not legal for us to import chemical weapons into our country. Uh, there were there were problems with configuration. There's just all these these complications that just made it really really hard to take it to the United States. Plus, you can just imagine even with the Pacific Island, the NIMBY effect that that, that starts up. You know, the people in the Mediterranean didn't want chemical weapons anywhere in the Mediterranean, you can imagine the protests that would have started if somebody said, well, all these terrible things from Syria are coming to our island and we're going to get rid of them here. So nobody wanted them. Uh, just one more story about the NIMBY problem was this little country of Albania becomes for a moment the fixation of the Pentagon because they think they can talk the Albanians into taking these weapons. They actually had a small plant that, that destroyed toxic chemicals. We had given them that you know, in the 90s. They, they wanted NATO membership. They were a poor country that needed help from us. And they agreed to take them until word leaked out. How much money, money did we offer them? The, the main thing we offered them, we never, I don't know a dollar figure, but we offered to give them essentially an industrial plant, a, a facility they could use for destroying their own toxic problems and also for the region. They could be a big money maker for them, a permanent facility. And they would have done it if there hadn't been this leak. And suddenly, almost overnight, we get tens of thousands of Albanians in the street outside parliament chanting that we don't want this stuff. And so we had to say, OK, well, <laughs> sounded like a great idea for a moment, but these, these aren't going to Albania. So it's back to the vote. And it becomes this worldwide NIMBY problem. Nobody wanted to take, take on this problem. I can well imagine. Lynn Minna wants to know, and you touched on it, but I'll ask you again, does the US have its own stockpiles of biological weapons? How confident are you that we don't? As confident as anything can be said with confidence these days, you can always put six or seven asterisks after it. But we we had a, a biological program uh, that we've developed in the Cold War. It made anthrax, it made a bunch of other things. Uh, President Nixon actually was the one that decided unilaterally that we don't want to do this anymore, so we got rid of it. What we did do, and we still have, is a pretty aggressive, and for some activists, a bit worrisome, program to research biological biological weapons threats. So if you want to know what your enemy might do to you, it makes sense to test um, things that they might send our way. So we've tried things like manipulating strains of anthrax to see how effective our vaccines are against it, um, you know, how, how you can uh, aerosolize different things to create uh, threats. And so you know, we, we do testing, um, we, we do all kinds of things to make sure that, that we're prepared to defend ourselves. And there is a, a gray, gray area, and this is often discussed in these communities, between, well, 
how much stuff do you have to make to test your defense capabilities? And where's the line between an offensive research program and a defensive research program? That becomes germane when you're talking about what the Russians are doing, because they have very similar labs, military labs that, that do the same kind of testing. We've never been allowed to go in or send people in to see what they're doing. And one has to, to wonder what the Russians are up to. If they're willing to experiment with nerve agents, which are outlawed, what else, are, what else is going on in that country? You know, I think when you read your book, everybody will have their favorite character that you profiled. Uh, mine was Hussam al-Nahas, mm -hmm. the doctor. Tell us about him. He, he was, he, he, in a sense, he's a very tragic figure, but so courageous. He was, he's one of my favorites. And to describe him, so when the war breaks out, he's in his early 20s, good looking kid, um, you know, just very dynamic, just, you know, has his entire future is ahead of him. He's going to be a doctor. He's going to work in a hospital. Mm -hmm. The war breaks out very inconveniently for him, and he gets dragged in. And he gets dragged in because the Syrian regime is beating up and killing opposition, you know, just student activists, and some of them are showing up at his hospital, and then they come in and they grab them, they take them out again, and then they're never seen. Three of his hospital friends uh, head out one day to get some supplies. They're stopped by some Assad's goons, they're taken out, beaten, tortured, lit on fire, and then their bodies are taken and dumped in front of the hospital with their medical ID tags on top of each body. And for young Dr. Al-Nahas, this is a, a turning point in a moment where he says, I can't be on the on the sidelines anymore. I have to I have to help. I have to do something. So he dedicates his life to helping the opposition, mostly as a doctor, but eventually as kind of a chemical weapons investigator. He he earns the nickname Chemical Hazem. Hazem is a nickname that means stubborn, and that kind of describes him. But he takes upon himself the very risky role of going into areas where chemical weapons attacks have taken place and trying to gather evidence and then sneaking the evidence back out of the country into Turkey where they can be given to the now, CIA. And I want you to tell the whole story because I want people to, to, to read it, but where is he now? So he did finally um, went to Turkey to get his, to finish his, his you know, he had a medical license. Uh, he was getting one in Syria, but he goes to Turkey to, to get one. And after he gets his, his MD, he comes to the United States and he's actually still here. He went to to the Johns Hopkins program. He's working on, on, a, on a public health uh, in a master's degree on top of his medical degree now and he's a great guy he lives you know probably about 30 miles from where i do but he's angry isn't he he feels he the united feels, states let him down and, and this is a very common sentiment and we we can have conversations with with uh, with guys like kusum and, and and understand their point of view on this which is that you know we don't understand if you know that the, the chemical weapons is one of many ways that you syria kills people and you seem to be fixated on that and not on the other ways that people are suffering and dying every year. You haven't solved the refugee problem. You haven't really you know, attended to any of these ills that are happening because of, of the conflict in Syria. And they do feel that America should have done more. They look to America as this beacon of hope and democracy and light. Why didn't you help us? Why didn't you come in and, and, and help in a more aggressive way? And so you know, the sense you get from them is, is one of disappointment to almost to the degree of feeling betrayal that the West did not fulfill its what they saw as its promise to help them out. You know, I, a lot of our younger viewers may not remember this, but when Bashar Assad took over, he was an ophthalmologist in London, glamorous wife. Everyone felt he was going to come in and be a great reformer. Yeah. What happened? You think? Yeah, that's that's absolutely true, and this is a great picture. And this, this is the view of him that that existed in the U.S. foreign policy community when he first came into office. Because here's someone that was part of the the, the Assad family, but he wasn't kind of cut out to be another dictator. Uh, the story on him is he became an ophthalmologist because he didn't like the sight of blood. How ironic is that? But eventually, he becomes co-opted by his own regime. He listens to the tough guys that say that we have to to just stamp out any resistance, any dissent has to be destroyed. And the one thing about the regime that makes it, you know, there are a lot of tough, brutal regimes in this part of the world. The Syrians are among the toughest. I had this one a diplomat who described a conversation with one of uh, Assad's henchmen, and he says, this brutality, we're built for this. Nobody does it better than we do. We're completely fearless, and we don't mind who we kill or what we destroy to make sure this regime survives. You know, when you look at the Syrian civil war or, or whatever we want to call it today, it has had such a dramatic impact around the world. 
I think, for instance, of the, the refugees flooding Europe. Mm. Um, you know, certainly we had some success by removing the chemical weapons, but when you really look at it net net, uh, the international community has has failed. Absolutely, and and I. I try to make this point, and I, and I try to talk about it almost as a caveat, as an apology for talking about the chemical weapons success, because the overall story in Syria is one of, of great failure, and it's a failure by many, many parties, including the United States. We didn't stop the refugee flow. We didn't stop the suffering. And it's not just a humanitarian problem, because the problems of Syria became global problems. The refugee wave that came out of Syria in, in 2015, 2016, destabilized democracies around the world. It led to the rise of some populist governments in, in Europe that were very anti-immigrant, very anti-refugee. So that that's partially thanks to this, this conflict. The other is the Islamic State. ISIS had existed as a terrorist group in Iraq. It had its rebirth in Syria because of this war, because there were vast areas of the countryside that were not controlled by the government. And those problems continue to give today. We continue to feel um, the, the effects of, of the horrific things that have happened because of this one civil war in a place in the world that most Americans could not point out on a map. President Biden says America's back. Is there a role for us? Can we work with our European colleagues? The hope is, and I know it gets very political and I, and I try not to go there with my, my own work, but the hope is that you know, engagement will make a difference and that for, for America to work closely with allies and, and, and be, you know, try to find you know, relationships and partnerships that work, that, that do good things, that's, that's a positive thing. And to the sense that if, if we're back, perhaps it's to the, to the extent that we're much more interested in engaging with our regional partners, with Europeans, to try to find solutions to problems that really defy solution. I mean, if you want to get into something complicated, try to figure out the, the you know, the, the relations between the Kurds and the Turks and the Syrians and, the, you know, all at each other's throats, you know, how does it ever get resolved? But we can't do it unless we really put our, you know, through all of our sleeves and get involved. Well, Joby, I want to thank you so much for joining us and for writing an, another great book. If I were on the Pulitzer Committee, you'd have your third Pulitzer. But, <laughs> uh, fun. Thank you for that. It's really been a, a, a great, enjoyable conversation. And Joby, I want to tell you about a program we're going to be having next week on uh, March 16th. Uh, and I really hope that all of you will have a chance to, to attend it. It's going to be March 16th at 6 p.m. Central Time. This is a program that we had planned over a year ago, Joby. Hmm. Uh, we were going to have all of these people in Dallas to have a panel discussion. Uh, Paul Richter wrote this phenomenal book, The Ambassadors. And why I'm really excited about it is when you look at who we're having, all of the issues are critical today. Ryan Crocker, you know, with the question about whether or not uh, we're going to withdraw the, all of the troops uh, earlier this morning. I was talking to uh, Charlie Kupchin. He believes we should leave Afghanistan. I suspect Ryan Crocker says we shouldn't. Robert Ford resigned as US ambassador to Syria because of our, our policy not to be more engaged. And Ann Patterson was ambassador to Egypt when Mubarak was uh, removed from office. So this is gonna be a remarkable conversation. And I wanna invite all of our friends in the World Affairs Council to, to, to attend if you, if you can. Um, and now I get to get out of my chair and give it to my wonderful successor, Liz. Liz, come on over. <laughs> A little switcheroo. <laughs> oh, Jim, it was so nice to have you back in the armchair of the council. That was lovely. And Joby, you are fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us and what a pleasure to have you. So I just want to remind everybody to pick up a copy of Joby's book and you can get it from Interabang Books, who is our partner. You can get 10% off in your shopping cart uh, using the code DFWWORLD and also our uh, councils around the country can uh, get it from bookshop.org as you see on your screen right now. Anyway, we are looking forward to next Tuesday. Thank you very much for joining us. And Joby, thank you again. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks again. Oh,